Decide immediately. Decide immediately. So, and that is the last presentation. I would uh, ask Professor Jurkin uh, to speak a little bit uh, about some interesting project that might link uh, the East and the West and also Africa a little bit uh, together. It is the Silk Road and how with auto images, with satellite images and with technology you can add on many things on Silk Road. Okay, please feel free. Words beside Club of Osiach, we started one year ago a new club in Vienna, located in Vienna, in, in first district in Vienna, is sustainable. We have, after a few months starting, we have already eight members, uh, in total 600 people. So that means the basic idea is we need a consortium where we have also, beside the public, a lot of private companies integrated. They show different things that fit together. Because one weather station guy is here, we are doing the GIS side, another is doing earmarks uh, like you heard here, etc. So a lot of companies, they do different things. But the key question is we need an integrative result of many companies that we have one access to it. Okay, please feel free to be quick. Yeah, thank you for your attention. New Silk Road, you already know about this project. It's 10 years old. Uh, everyone in this country, probably in this world, already know about it. But the thing is that uh, basically the idea of the Silk Road is more than 2,000 years. It was already done back in uh, 3rd century before the Christ. So the problem is that it was only from the eastern part of China until the mm, location of Sa Istanbul right now. The problem is that it could be much, much bigger and it could connect Moscow, it could connect Vienna, it could connect Paris, it could connect all parts of the world. So it could be the biggest infrastructure and anthropogenic project in the history of humankind. But the thing is that it could have a really, really big impact on the nature environment. As a result, there could be a really, really big ecological crisis. So the thing is, that already mentioned before, uh, we need to think about the balance of the ecology and economy. So in that case, of course, the relevance, <laughs> some basic stuff we need to think. Uh, the thing is that we should think about the term of natural resource potential. I don't know really, is it common term of natural resource potential in the Western countries, I know. It's quite common in uh, Russia, in uh, post-Soviet Union countries. So uh, this term basically, uh, again, about the Silk Road, as it should be uh, in two, three corridors. By the way, <laughs> right now you can see that um, some of the US and probably even European scientists just forget about the central and uh, the northern corridors of the Silk Road. They just uh, point the southern one, but uh, I have no idea what's the point of uh, just dismissing another corridors because they are really needed to just increase the trade route and the, uh, the trade, um, <laughs> just the trade. So. Uh, uh, back to uh, the term of the natural resource potential. Uh, basically, uh, it's a set of natural resources that are the basis of the economic development of the territory. A small region, the big region, is not, it's not really important. And their provision for certain sections of, uh, sectors of economy and their impact on the formation of economic specialization and the spatial organization of the territory. But if we think the, about this term more deeply in maybe in some point of informatics, it's a generalized indicator, in fact, that adequately reflects the trends in uh, dynamics change of the natural environment when we have an impact on it. And uh, during its natural and inf uh, anthropogenic uh, evolution. So it was already um, rebuilt in Mr. Jurkin's article in 2012. If someone need to see it, I can give it up to this presentation. That's no problem. Uh, even though it is in Russian, but I will tell you the most of the things in English, if you need it. 
And now about the nature of resource potential representation, how it should be uh, reflected <laughs> to understand the basis of the change of the environment. Yeah. So the first point is its implementation of the overlay intersection of several information layers on a digital map, of course. And so the ecosystem layer, it's one of them, the first one, the basic one. Also, it's a land use layer. It's common for cadaster. And the territory pollution layer, of course, because if we have an impact on the environment, it's always be a pollution. The second variant to represent it, it's an application of ecosystem boundaries. So we need to use uh, boundaries layers where each contour of the ecosystem is assigned an attribute. Uh, so also we need uh, weight coefficients and a weight and average of the natural resource potential is calculated from that, these contours. And the third way of uh, natural resource representation is a dynamic three-dimensional model uh, in which the space-time interpolation is just a basic discrete function where x and y are spatial coordinates and t's, <laughs> of course, the time. And it's realized according to its values in the local contours of the bias boundaries. Uh, <laughs> let's see about the math. It was the idea of Dr. Zhukin to represent the basis of the natural resource estimation. So the left one is Dr. Zhukin's formula. It's just, uh, as you can see. Uh, and another way is uh, Mr. Dmitriev, a PhD candidate from St. Petersburg, and his point of view on uh, natural resource potential estimation. Uh, as you can see on the left side, uh, we have a sum of um, mass uh, of array from I, where is the one, to K, where K is the number of environmental factors that has an influence and characterize the ecostate of the territory. Um, at the same time, in Mr. Dmitriev formula, it's uh, a sum of the factors, where Q is uh, the transform dimensions value, and P is a uh, weight coefficient, basically. Uh, according to Mr. Jokin's formula, the conditions to which the values of partial criteria must meet, it's three points, of course, is that the values of the criteria should be dimensionsless, as I already said before. Also, the values of the criteria must be determined on the same numerical set, and values of criteria should have the same monotonous character. And also, we need to say that the formula, uh, and which you can see on the right side, um, could be used to characterize and to estimate with a partial criterion I already said. It's a rather primitive formula, because you can see there's nothing really special. Uh, and now we just move on to Mr. Dmitriev uh, formula. And there is a trouble with it, <laughs> as you can see. It works in two different types, in two different ways. Uh, first one is when conversion formula is dimensionless in quantity of this criteria is the first type, one whose values in increase, and that's lead an improvement of the system quality. But on, this, on the right way, as you can see, uh, in this conversion formula, uh, this way, values increase leads to a decline in this inequality. As a result, we have uh, a way that this formula, in some cases, shows a degradation of an environment. In some cases, it shows an increase. So it's a uh, natural rebound. So this is the problem of Mr. Dmitry formula that it could be used in usual way. As a result, there is. Uh, probably a lot of advantages of Dr. Zhukin method. It's the first one, it's facility, so it could be used anyway uh, because the influence value of the echo factors is determined numerically through a power function. And of course, it's, it's objectivity because uh, in Mr. Dmitry formula, uh, part, um, each particular criterion is assigned by experts. When you have experts, we have a subjection view. This one could say that everything is fine. This could, could say that mm, there is a decline in the environment. As a result, this is not an objective way of estimation of the natural environment. So, and this one is the basic formula of Mr. Zhukin to estimate ecological state of the territory. Uh, in this case, uh, he uses 
as many properties as possible. So we should think about the atmosphere in the conditions, we should think about the hydrosphere, about the water inside the Earth and the, on the surface of the Earth. We should think about the lithosphere and its conditions, of course, the soils. We should think about the flora and everything that surrounds the forests, uh, meadows and everything. We should think about the animals, I mean fauna, and of course we should think about the human conditions because as Dr. Jukin suppose, basically we have only one type of ecology. What? It, <laughs> it's still bad. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay. Dr. Jukin suppose that basically there is only one type of ecology. It's humankind ecology. So the humankind uh, realize and understands uh, what the earth should be. Of course, the humankind should think about uh, how it should influence on the flora and fauna and everything. Because if we had bad influence on the environment, we're already <laughs> we're just ready to ruin the humankind itself. So that's why he supposed that we should have the only one type of ecology, humankind ecology. So, uh, some schemes. It's basically, well, <laughs> this scheme was done back in 1992, so as a result, you understand that the architecture of the conceptual ecological and technical information system was done many years ago. Uh, it consists of these basic subsystems to evaluate the anthropogenic impact, to collect all the information about the ecology state of the region or the small territory, it doesn't really matter, uh, to rectificate and make a decision and to make a forecast, of course, and as a result to make uh, an indicator for an uh, operator or maybe a consultant or maybe. It depends on uh, what you end user we have. And this one is the flowchart of the echo data collection subsystem, the first one on the previous scheme. And in this case, Dr. Jurgen supposed that we work on three levels. It's a global level of information, and of course the remote sensing information. A regional level, we have when we have a small scale, of less than a million. Uh, and of course the local level, when we work with uh, topographic, small topographic maps. And on the, on the <laughs> damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, the, he supposed that we should use as many uh, sources of information to characterize uh, the state of the uh, region that we uh, have in the survey. So we should use national test sites. Probably we should use national parks because national parks are probably the best way to estimate the condition of the environment because territories that surround national parks probably are already under the influence of anthropogenic uh, factors. As a result, they are not in the first condition. Uh, also, we need to use remote sensing data and probably we should use not only the space-borne data because of the spatial resolution of this imagery, but also we need to use unmanned uh, aerial vehicles because we could use them rapidly, we can use them probably not in any weather condition, but anyway we could use them much more cheaply and much more faster than airborne um, divisions to make a survey. So, um, this is just a list of um, our university works that already were already carried out previously. This is a fragment of the natural resource potential map. Uh, this was done back in 2012 for Moscow region, as you can see. Uh, this one is a cartographic representation of the natural resource potential map. Uh, in, in this case, it's Zaugsky district of the Tula region, where we have a test site of our university. Um, this is just uh, information about our experience in unmanned, uh, unmanned aerial systems that we carried out since 2011, so it's nearly 10 years experience. Um, this is the prototype of our uh, 
uh, drone that was done in late 2013-2014. It's an electrical one. Right now we are working about uh, hybrid uh, solutions that have already electric and, and petrol engines just because we need more time to make survey. So, this is the representation of our test site in Tula region. This is a 3D terrain model already done by a survey with uh, many aerial vehicles that we've done. And this is a survey of fires in Smolensk region back in 2013, also the result of the work in our university. So, to sum up, here is a slide that shows the already done uh, let's just say better version of the project with its title and the main aim to develop a GIS that will um, estimate uh, and map the natural resource potential of the regions and of course uh, in such case the new silk roads, transport routes and uh, just the list of the tasks that we need to do it's of course the framework that should we, that should we should develop uh, of course, we need to think about uh, methods to classification of the ecosystems. Uh, also, we need to develop a technique to collect, process, and analyze remote sensing information and probably hyperspectral information about natural resource potential and just another tasks you can see in the works we have. As a result, we will have a thematic geoinformation system to quantify the natural resource potential. We will have methods and algorithms to work with such uh, data set. And, of course, methods to work with hyperspectral information. That's probably brief, briefly all. Yeah. If you've got some questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this, uh, I would say, exciting presentation because it tells what is the real importance of the future and how to manage the whole thing. Uh, and uh, I think maybe maybe a small example, I, I jump back because this is a little bit linked. Uh, I jumped back 30 years ago. Uh, I made as an expert at the court and more or less an investigation of emissions of a dramatic drama that happened in Austria around an emittent, around the big factories, two big factories. And at the end, the forest was destroyed. So it was an economic and an ecological target, both together. So since this time, I started to develop these models. And I'm happy that Professor Schurk and this uh, concept is absolutely in the right direction. And this is important because we have to get both things under control. We have to understand we have to survive. That means we need economy also, but we need ecology too. And this is exactly the topic, how we can integrate these two things uh, for a long-term and sustainable future. Thank you very much for this presentation. Decide immediately. Decide immediately.